In this video, I'm going to talk about how we actually go about doing inference on co-integrating relationships. And this is assuming that we're not that interested in short run dynamics because there are other, other methods for doing inference if we are also interested in short run dynamics, which we'll come on to discuss in future videos. So the idea here is that we suppose that there is some long run co-integrating relationship between Y and X which looks something like this. And we already spoke about the fact that even though yt and xt may themselves be i1, the least squares estimator for beta is actually consistent in that as the sample size tends to infinity, the bias tends to zero. So supposing that there is some sort of long run relationship between y and x, the least squares estimator turns out to be consistent. So that's a good thing. So you might think that we can just do inference on the, or using the normal T statistic for the estimated value of beta. Well, it turns out we can't because of the fact that XT is I1 and YT itself is I1. So normal asymptotic theory doesn't necessarily apply. So immediately, it's not clear how we can actually go about doing any inference. Even though we can estimate the parameter beta, we can't necessarily say with any degree of confidence what its value lies between, or we can't construct any sort of error about our estimates. But all is not lost. Because remember that if it is the case that we have the strict exogeneity assumption upheld. So that means that the expectation of ET given XS equals zero. If we assume that, if we also assume that we have homo scedastic errors, so that means that the variance of ET is equal to a constant. If we assume that as well as having no serial correlation and if we have normal errors, then we don't actually need to appeal to asymptotic theory. And it will actually be the case that beta hat in finite samples is normally distributed around the true parameter beta. So we don't actually need to appeal to asymptotic theory. But it looks a bit like I've replaced one problem which seemed like a relatively serious problem with another problem which is far more serious because we know it's often the case that the strict exogeneity assumption isn't true. So the expectation of ET given XS certainly isn't zero. It's often the case that we have homoscholastic errors and we can sort of deal with serial correlation by estimating our model using robust standard errors. And often it's the case that we might have normal errors within sort of any sort of normal error test. But this strict exogeneity one seems like it could realistically be a bit of a problem. And it seems like a problem until you realize that essentially another way and perhaps a slightly better way of writing the strict exogeneity assumption is that the expectation of ET given changes in X for any time period S have to be equal to zero. This is actually a slightly more correct way of writing the strict exogeneity assumption. Okay, so how does that help? Well, the way this helps is if we write out the ET, we know that ET is in general going to be some function of these changes in X because we're assuming that the strict exogeneity assumption doesn't hold. So we assume that ET is equal to, let's say, delta k times, or well, actually let's not use delta, let's use gamma, gamma k times a delta x t plus k, plus let's say gamma k minus one times delta x t plus k minus one. And in principle, we continue all the way until we get to the fact that we actually have delta zero times delta, or gamma zero times delta x t, and in principle, even though it is, we've included a lead, we also need to include potential lagged values of these delta terms. So we could sort of continue all the way up to, I'm going to call this one gamma minus k times delta x t minus k. 
And once we have essentially taken into account all of this variation in ET, which is due to these other values of X or these other values of the change in X, we're left with an, a sort of error term VT, which by construction, by mere fact that I've said that ET depends on all these other factors, by mere construction, the expectation of VT, given any change in X, is equal to zero. In other words, VT does actually satisfy the strict exogeneity assumption. So if there was a way that we could get this VT into this above regression in place of ET, then we would have actually solved our problem. And this all comes together in the leads and lags estimator. So the idea here is that we regress yt on alpha plus beta xt, and then we explicitly include all of these leads and lags. And you say, well, how many leads and lags do I need to include? Well, it kind of depends on a number of things. It depends on whether you think it's likely that the error term is going to be correlated with some change in XT a long, long way in the future. Perhaps if you're dealing with monthly series, you might want to include these leads and lags up to sort of the 12th lag in the future, uh, lead in the future, and the 12th lag behind. But in principle, you might not have enough data to do that. So it kind of depends on your data as to how many leads and lags you need to include. But the idea is if you include all of these leads and lags, then you'll be left with an error VT. And the idea with this VT is it will be by construction strictly exogenous. So we actually will have this first assumption being upheld. And if we have that first assumption being upheld and assuming we don't have serial correlation or heteroscedasticity, and assuming we have normal errors, then we can actually go ahead and do inference on our model. There are other ways of doing inference on long run relationships and they have essentially to do with taking the short run dynamics into account in a slightly perhaps neater way than the leads and lags estimator does. Um, we're going to come on to discuss those in the future but the leads and lags estimator is a way of doing inference on long run parameters even if we don't really explicitly take into account the short run dynamics.